what I'll always do is choose one side to develop a focal point or area of interest in. Or I would choose to work on either the lights or the darks, but not usually both of them. This video is all about rendering on top of a gesture drawing. Michael goes through and demonstrates what he's thinking step by step from advanced anatomy to basic shape. Designing anatomy and shadows is arguably the hardest part of the whole drawing. And then how can I design this so that I don't want to kill myself? Rendering can be really easy, but only if you have a clear and concise roadmap to do it. If you could break down your figure into two values with clean edges, you'd get 90% of the way there to having a good looking drawing. Everything else is just icing on the cake. So here's my arm, let's start there. So I'm seeing on the back of the deltoid. So women have more subcutaneous fat here than men. That's why it's a little bit harder to see the tricep and the tricep is generally a bit softer. As I move down, I get some of the back of the deltoid and then that casts a shadow out. And then it's a little sharper here, kind of down, maybe over the terrace major and then links up with that. I'm gonna vary it. Doesn't have to be extreme, but a little softer on spheres a little tighter on cylinders, deltoids a sphere, triceps a cylinder, let's say for argument, and then elbow is a box. Then I get to the elbow, that's a sharp surface, projected bone. You could see that the ridge group itself has a little turn, that's a little cylinder, so that makes a little pocket and then an accent. This is the, maybe the anaconius uh, extensors, flexors, and then the Ulna and the bone there would be sharp. So that hits around that little little bone, maybe it jumps down across the palm, and then the plane changes of the knuckles. I started there because it was my lead form. That's like the, the closest form hitting the light. And then I could always come back and like, you could shift the proportion or, or kind of shave into it. But now I want to deal with its impact because it's putting a cast shadow on some things. So this, after that cast shadow comes out, then it does another one that goes around your scapula. What's a scapula as a form? It's like a box. So that's not gonna have edge. That's gonna be like a plane break. And I could see the kind of the back wing or that medial border of the scapula pushing in. And then what's the next form? Because I have a bit of a fill light on this side. So I think the next form is this would be the spinal erectors. So that's a cylinder or an egg. So that's what this core shadow is to me, or, or kind of this area, is the scapula pushing on that. And then as I just study shape, I see a little window here where the something's, maybe the, the arms cast a little bit on the rib cage. There's a soft edge and then a little shape that sits there. And you don't have to know all these things. You know, I should probably just shut up about it, but you can, you can just see them. And if you look carefully or closely enough, I think you can describe and see or discern for yourself how these edges are working. So let's not, for the moment, get too much into the, the half tones that are in the dark. I want to just do a, separate my big lights from darks to begin. So where else do I have lights and darks? Well, the back of the leg. Okay, so let's go back here. Back of the leg, the hand's in the way, right? So that's okay. So that what am I looking at here? Or what would be coming above that hand? That's the hamstring. Hamstring's a ball, so I'm gonna light it like a long, thin ball. And then you can see that that changes into the sartorius. That's a soft form. Okay. The back of your knee, that's called your popliteal surface. That's fat that sits on top of the insertion of the gastrocnemius in the back of the femur. And then once I get down here, the back of your calf, this is just an egg. So I'm gonna light that like a ball. So see how my edge gets softer? And then that tightens to be the Achilles tendon. I'll do a little cast shadow design on the floor. But, you know, we wanna get the relationship of light to the environment. And now what's the light shadow patterning on the other side? Okay, so on this side, we'd have cast shadow from one leg onto the other. So I see a little shape like this, goes around. This is a form shadow, also lighting the sartorius or the back of the hamstring. So cast, form, makes another little cast shadow into the back of that knee, over onto the popliteal surface, and then that flows into the soft meat of the calf. So we get to smooth out our edges, down into the back of the hamstring, and then pretty well, pretty well done there. 
So that's light shadow everywhere I see it. Let's do the hair. It's a little more confusing here, right? Because it looks like there's more, maybe multiple light sources. So I'm just gonna separate this based on the that light source we started with. So I'm gonna say head or ball is prominent. And then how can I design this so that I don't wanna kill myself? Here's the, let's just say plane break. And then down here. So just kind of making that a geometry, like a helmet. We could do the same thing on this side too. That's a cylinder. And then that creates maybe a little cast shadow in there. Okay, so that's my step one. And when I'm done, I'll just fill it in. So here's my mid-tone value. And if I did a, a relatively decent job with my mapping, my edges, there should already be some some like nice form just in the turn of that core shadow edge from the light into the shadow. But I would start to unify this in a way that puts one basic tone down so that I can see the graphic interplay of, of light versus dark and how edge is working. So I'm going to do that really quick. This is a pretty common way of drawing, just mapping light between dark. And then we can make alterations to kind of fudge with it a bit. But what I'll always do is choose one side to develop a focal point or area of interest in. So, you know, we could work on, or I would choose to work on either the lights or the darks, but not usually both of them. I think something like that can kind of feel confusing or a little bizarre. Uh, the other thing I'm going to have to do is drop the local value of the hair. Right, the body has a local value that's light. Local value just means the inherent value of an object minus the light. So like if you didn't have a, a light on this, on this woman, where would her skin value rest? So maybe like a three on the value scale, three being relatively light. Where does the hair sit? The inherent local value of the hair or the inherent value of the hair might be a five because red is usually a a darker value. And if you get confused, you can just, uh, the color wheel matches the value scale. Our yellow, orange, red, green, blue, purple corresponds to value one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. 10. Right? That's why a lot of old master paintings just kind of show the progression through the color wheel for their values. Okay, so that's a lay-in. Now what next? Well, there's some things you could do that might help still at, at an early stage like this. So. I can kind of cheat the light source by maybe taking some of the forms that are further away and just giving them a slight cast. Maybe I'll make like the bottom of the femur darker or down here, just the legs as a whole kind of push the value down. I think that has a nice way of communicating light's dissipation. That as we get further from the light source, it gets progressively weaker. And in that sense, I'm always focused more on drawing the light or the, the effect of the light than I am rendering a body. Right, so maybe maybe I start to let that light right off the hip, you know, get, get dark. But up here, I'll like bring this up, I'll really push the lighter, the lighter values. Um, so you have that, I'm really kind of painting out some of those construction lines. But maybe a pose like this, we would spend more time in the shadows. So we could first, maybe if you want to just come back and revisit the hair a bit, I'll spend a little bit of time here. Texture takes place in half tones. I don't put texture anywhere but in the half tones. So in half tone, you'll find the most color and the clearest impression of the texture because the light doesn't bleach it. I'm also kind of trying to design a little like rhythm through here. Like I don't want to just copy what I see in the hair. I want to try to create some kind of design that will keep the eye moving. So I try to design it in chunks, like maybe a chunk of, you know, half tone texture here that's sweeping or wrapping in a way that gives um, volume. And then a very size too, like try to jump between big, medium, small, so it doesn't become overly monotonous or anything. Like I could see some texture here, and then a lot of texture here. 
can also be loose. I think it's really interesting if you go to the museum and you know stare up close at, at you know, any kind of master painting or old painting that you like, how up close most things that we see from a distance that look very convincing and realistic from a distance are really abstract up close. Like a few dots in a brush stroke are the but those people knew from a distance that they can create this incredible impression of realism uh, with an incredible economical handling the language of mark making. It's probably one of my favorite things about painting and drawing. And then, so that's the hair with the two or three values. Let's add one more just to kind of bring out some of those, those fun areas of streak or light. Maybe I'll just try to place these on uh, corners. So like that's where that corner turn of the skull would be. Where we're trying to uh, relate the different little blocky forms that I made for the hair. We're just kind of pulling out different textural passages. Could be fun. But I don't want to spend too long there. I mean, who wants to draw hair? No one. The thing I think is important in a, a value rendering or a rendering period is to not outline. So, you know, something like this, if I were doing more of a longer study or a painting, I would definitely have the background in as well. And so when I'm drawing this shoulder, you know, I'd want to be trying to create some type of edge through there. And it could be a lost or a sharp or a firm edge. But I would want it to be pushing as much as possible to lose edge, lose line, I guess, um, and incorporate as much edge as atmospheric as possible. Even from the standpoint of like a value comp, this would be more interesting. I'm thinking of like James Gurney's um, counter change value composition that he talks about in, um, I think, the imaginative book. This is a reflected light on the back of that arm. So I just want to be careful with that reflected light that I don't get as dark as anything in the darks. But so what I'm going to do for this one is I'm going to bring more value into the darks. So the way that I think about rendering is, like here's our start. We did a value scale, value one, value five, value 10. That's my lay-in. So I got all those values mapped out then. I create a focal point by then bringing resolution to one side or the other. That's it. Right? I think our brains get a little fatigued when there's too much work. So let's do that for the dark because I have all these fun shapes here. Like here's that darker area for that cast shadow. But I usually just start this progressively by building in one value at a time. So if I have my five and 10, maybe I start with like a value eight and, and introduce that dark and then see how that impacts things. And then maybe I need another, or maybe that's good. Maybe that gives enough explanation to this area. So I'm seeing this. Um, I could bring a little bit of that reflection back here on the wing of that scapula. It just gets a little bit brighter in here. On the other side of the spine, there's a much darker shape. And that might be the cast shadow from the spinal erector on the right side of her body. So that's, I'm going to say that's round, or it's soft, maybe cylindrical, and then that goes all the way down in what's called the trough of the spine, to the sacrum. So that's this. But see, I'm still thinking ball, egg, box, all those things. Sometimes it's not even a bad idea to light the rib cage. Maybe just kind of reconnect with that big form of the, the egg. If you ever feel like your individual value is, are kind of getting lost in them, or I've, I've used too much of an emphasis on some of these smaller shapes or, or smaller gradations, I'll come back and summarize them with that bigger rib cage. 
which you see I kind of did there at the bottom. I think it, it helps. Here's a, a box scapula. Then it softens a bit at the bottom. There's a cast shadow this way that kind of joins up with this shape. The other thing I'm trying to do that James Gurney talks about in that imaginative real book, he calls it shape welding, which I think is a cool way to think of it as a concept that all the shapes do weld together, creating one larger pattern. And the concept behind that is that you're designing this great big pattern and each little shape indicates kind of important information about what's underneath but it still has this larger compositional importance. Okay, so we're working over here. What's happening on this side? Well, I do get a little of that fill light, so that's confusing. But it's nice because it gives us, way we could see those forms better. But it makes it so that now I get the arm lit this way. So that's kind of our core, core shadow. And then our shadow is this. And then core shadow for the form comes this way. And I think the hand is just in shadow. Fingers, palm. Um, so that's a good amount of that that part done. So let's let's start working our way down. So we have let everything kind of build at the same. The shadow that's on the back of the pelvis here looks like it might be part of the arm or from the arm. It could also just be a core shadow related to the roundness of the the muscle and the fat here. So let's fill that in. This side definitely looks more like a form shadow. So this is a wrapping curve that would be representative of a. Uh, egg or a sphere and you can see there's a little bit of a looks like a fill light or a bounce light from the ground underneath I don't know how important that is we could always kind of indicate for it later into our legs so now I, what I could see is that I need to go a little bit darker here in my my basic shadow shape. So let's just take that as a whole piece and drop it. And I think I could, I'm gonna give a, another consideration to some of the, just the shape design of this leg. Maybe this, this could be a little bit higher. Let's do a, do I wanna do any darker values here? We can, we could say, um, there's a darker value under the gluteal fold and that Kind of is centered to the leg. This lesson was taken from Michael's course on the introduction to figure construction on proco.com. He just added new lessons on gesture drawing and rendering. Use the code gesture20 for 20% off if you're interested. The link is in the description. Thanks.